So our next speaker is Neil D. Steinberg. Neil is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Rhode Island Foundation. That organization works to address the needs of Rhode Island's diverse communities through philanthropy, grant making, and community leadership. In 2018, with assets of approximately 970 million, the organization raised 114 million and distributed 52 million in grants. So Steinberg came to Rhode Island Foundation in 2008 from Brown University, his alma mater, and served as vice president of development. For three decades prior to that, he worked for Fleet Bank Financial, which I found that picture from when he left. <laughs> he said that was last year. I know Neil from my days at Projo, and I used to write about all of the great things that the Rhode Island Foundation did. I've been fond of him forever, and um, my uncle, Mike Van Leesten, and he did a lot of work together, and I am so excited to invite Neil Steinberg to the stage. So I tried to pay every one of those other guys to go after William, and nobody would take it. So thank you for your inspiration. Um, I may not have the energy right now, but I will try and carry on your, your thoughts. Thank you. So if you haven't figured out yet by the, the fact that I had to sit down, um, I'm representing a demographic here. It's old white guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was in my office at 6 a.m. this morning, and I'm tired. <laughs> but I'm energized by the group. I am energized by this opportunity and we'll see if I can impart some things that might be of interest. I have notes here just as a crutch, and usually I could just talk off the top of my head, but thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna tell you a few things that I would tell myself when I was young, and then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to hear about um, my experience and with a little different lens, a little different take uh, about my limited, but significant to me experience of being discriminated against and feeling like a minority. So you all are looking at the guy in the suit that just reeks of white privilege. There is nowhere in this state when I'm dressed like this that I can't get into whether I deserve to be there or not. But that wasn't always the case. But a couple of things just for the heck of it of what I would tell my young self. So when I was 13, all the girls were taller than me. I would tell myself, you will grow. You will get taller. You won't be the shortest one in the gym waiting to dance when all the girls are taller than you are. The other thing I was very sensitive about when I was young and I was athletic, but boy, you could see my ribs. You know, I don't know, people are as old as I am if anybody's around here. You know, there used to be uh, ads for feed people around the world and all of that. My ribs would show. And I remember going to the doctor once with my mother and saying, Doctor, how can I gain weight? And I'll never forget he said this. I was 13 years old, didn't appreciate it, kind of thought it was stupid until I got older. He said, wait till you're 40. You'll gain all the weight you want and a whole lot you don't want. And he was right. The other thing is my parents were very good. I grew up in, a, in Connecticut, what would now be described as a lower middle class family. Uh, parents didn't go to college. I was the first one to go to college. But my father would always tell me, and I got pretty good grades. I was lucky. I was in a, a reasonable school and, and, and studied and stuff. And he would always remind me that being book smart was not enough. He'd say, you may be book smart, but you don't have any common sense. And I didn't really understand that. Common sense, street smarts. I've hired a lot of people a lot of places over the years. Easy to test whether they could read or write and do arithmetic. Impossible to test if they had common sense. You don't know till you work with them. So that's another thing I would tell my young self. Pay attention on the common sense. And then the last thing that I would say, and again, many of you already know this, is that I learned from those teachers, from those coaches, from my parents, who said hustle and work hard. And hustle was get there first. Hustle was show up early. Hustle was run down the base path even if you hit it to the pitcher. Hustle was to constantly move and constantly show the effort. 
And the other was work hard. So I am a firm believer that anybody can get better at anything if they work hard. They may not be the best. You're not going to take somebody and create a, an Olympic athlete or a Rhodes Scholar or a Pulitzer Prize winner, but everybody at all ages has the ability to try and get a skill, to try and accomplish something, and by hard work, guaranteed, they will be better than the, the day they started. And very important things that I learned. I tried to teach my kids that. I tried to teach them hustle, get there early. I'm the only person in my family that gets anywhere on time. It is the biggest sort. I've tried to set the clock ahead with my wife. I tried everything, and, and it doesn't work. And finally, I told them, I said, here's the real secret. If you get there early, you get your choice of the food. You get there late, you get the scraps. <clears throat> you want the brownies? You better get there first. Otherwise, you're going to get those sugar cookies. I said, you want the meat? You better get there first or you're going to get the salad, right? What's left at the end? The good stuff that's good for you, not the good stuff. So anyway, those are just some, some things that, that I would tell my young self. So here's the part. We'll see how it plays with you. I don't know. We'll see if you buy it. So when I was young, and I would say up through my teenage years, up through college, there was a big part of my life where I felt like a minority. I felt the impact of discrimination. I felt looked down upon, and I had a hard time with it. And I don't know if you can guess what that emanates from. So the first thing, I'll give you the clue. My name is Neil Steinberg. I am Jewish. 2% of the United States, less than any other ethnic group, Jewish. I grew up in this lower middle class neighborhood in Connecticut. Very few people were Jewish. I kind of knew I was Jewish. I didn't know it was different until I knew it was different. And how did I know it was different? When I got treated differently. And I got called names, and I got asked questions, and why this was different. And believe me, we were not a very religious family. We observed, but we were not sitting there every day wearing things and showing up at the, at the synagogue every Saturday morning. So people went by the name. Purely by the name, they would say things and I, was, I learned to get over it. Okay. Where did it get magnified, though, is when I got into sports. Okay. So I played a lot of different sports, but my sport in high school and in college became track. Now, look at me. Neil Steinberg, skinny white Jewish guy. What event was I supposed to, to compete in? Somebody want to pick? Right. I'm the fastest white guy you ever met. And I'll take you out on the track right now, and I'll prove it. <laughs> 50 meter, 100 meter, 200 meter, 400 meter with a gun to my head. After that, I took the bus. I was a sprinter. I have no patience. I have a short attention span. And guess what? I can run quick, and I learned that at a young age. But I got to tell you, showing up on the team for a tryout at a track meet, as a white sprinter with the name Steinberg, I got no respect. I got put in that lane. I got asked, what the hell are you doing here? Now, I'm not looking for sympathy, right? I didn't get left out of school. I didn't go through hardships that many, many people go through for whatever category they belong to. But I will tell you, it was very hard. It was impactful and it hurt, but it was instructional for me in later life. So I was on the high school team, and I'm running, and I'm doing pretty well. And the biggest compliment I ever got paid in high school, I ran the state championships in Connecticut, 1971, University of Connecticut. And there was a guy in the, in the lane right next to me, and he looked like a sprinter supposed to look. He was six foot two, he was black, he was a football player, and he was chiseled. Now, I don't know how many of you, you know running or whatever. You get down in the starting blocks. His muscles were in my lane. <laughs> I, I had to go like this in, in my lane. So I get there. I make it to the final. And, and, you know, this guy's a stud. He's a sophomore. He's the best in the state. I knew him by reputation. I remember his name now. It was Pablo Franco. Went on to the University of Washington to start. Anyway, long story short, we run the race. It's the finals of the 100 meter in the state of Connecticut. 
And I got third place, which I was ecstatic about. Set a school record, got third place. And afterwards, my coach came up to see me, and he said, Pablo told his coach, he, or asked his coach, who was that skinny white guy that stayed with me for 50 yards? Now, the significance of that was that, remember, it was 100 yards. So the fact that I stayed with 50 yards, and if anybody knows track, this guy ran 9.5 as a sophomore in high school, 100 yards in, in the day, and I ran 9.9. So that sounds like a little, if you don't know running, if you know sprinting, that's four yards. So I was waving to his back. But the fact that he recognized, and the recognition to me, as strange as that sounded, was a big deal. But it continued. It continued into college. I was very fortunate. I got good grades and stuff. And it was easier to get into in the, in the 70s. I went to Brown University right over there. And believe it or not, Brown University at the time did not have an indoor track. We used the Moses Brown Fieldhouse. I don't know what direction I'm pointing in. It's a couple hundred yards away from here. That's where I ran my track meets indoors, the Moses Brown track. The first meet, the very first meet that I ran as a freshman, we could run varsity. I ran 50-yard dash, made it to the finals. I was not the fastest guy on the team, but I made it to the finals. And I was there hanging out. So when I'm a sprinter and, and I'm in that entity, you know, all my teammates that I'm actually working out with, most of my friends on the team were all black. Those were the sprinters. It was fine. It was easy. However, this was the 70s. It was not easy at Brown. And I'm there running for Brown University, and there was a guy who was a classmate of mine who was black rooting against me and rooting for the guy from Boston College because he was black and I was white, even though we went to the same school, even though we knew each other. And that was a little discouraging. It actually pissed me off. I was just angry. But the, the part about it that was the best is my teammates giving him grief for doing that. How the hell could you root for somebody on the other team over somebody on your team just because you identify with the race? So these were impressionable times for me. I wasn't that slick. I wasn't that worldly. I learned a lot of these things then. I have integrated more relay teams than most people have integrated schools. Right? So I'm the guy that stood out when there were four of us showing up to run a four by 100 relay. And I took great pride in being the fourth fastest guy running with three faster guys. That's actually the secret to running and, and doing great in relays. Find three faster guys than you and run. If you find four faster guys, you don't get to run. <laughs> so it was very, very simple. But these guys, my teammates became my brothers. My best friend in life is the fastest guy who ever ran at Brown, James Rudisill from D.C. He's an attorney down there now. We talk all the time. You know, and, and again, I'm preaching sports, and not everybody identifies with that. Sports builds camaraderie. It builds brother. It builds nothing. But I never forgot all of those times, and it continued. I ran in my 20s. I ran at the Penn Relays many years. I was the only white guy in the final of many 100-yard and then later 100-meter races. And again, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just telling you that it was so noticeable to me. I remember how I felt that now I am in a position of running a large foundation having a lot of influence, working with all the communities in, the Ro in Rhode Island, donors with a lot of money, underserved communities that need a lot of help, the whole gamut. I never forget what somebody who I'm talking with feels like in their life. I never forget walking into a room. A year ago, I went down. So when I was at Brown, my senior year, we had a new track coach. His name was Doug Terry. Some of you might have known him years ago. He was, for many years, the coach at Boys High in Brooklyn. Legendary place for, for track. Their high school team was faster than our college team. And I was his first captain. We stayed friends for years. We really bonded, bonded with his family. He was not well. His kids had a, a, a birthday party down in, in Brooklyn for him. Um, and I got to go see him. And I got to connect with the guys that ran for his team 
and the guys that ran for my team with me who knew Doug. And I was there two hours before I figured out in a room full of 80 people, you know what I'm going to say. I was the only white brother. <laughs> but the reason I say that, as silly as it sounds, and I don't mean to be superficial about it, that wasn't the identity. That wasn't the bond. It was whether I could beat those guys or not. Years ago, or now out on the street. It was shared experiences we had and a coach that we revered and a coach that taught us things and a coach who was still a life lesson to us. So I tried it out. I thought about this. I can't show up looking like this and look for somebody to say, oh, man, he had a tough life. Because I didn't. I had a lot of ups and downs, but I didn't have a tough life. And I didn't want to show up like this and say, you know, oh, man, I was discriminated. Feel sorry for me. No, but I did want to send the message or at least give the message when I thought about my young self and what did I learn other than show up on time and work hard and do a little more training than somebody else to, to, to wind up doing well in the race that I did experience and did learn from and did embrace differences, people who were different, people who were thought people who thought that I was inferior for a reason and somebody else was superior. There is nothing that made me feel more accomplished than the times I did beat the guy who looked like he was supposed to beat me. <laughs> and that great equalizer of the starting line, which I will call the starting line of life, that when the gun went off and we started the race, when the gun went off and we started the career, when the gun went off and we started the activity, nobody's background, what their father did, what their family made for money or anything counted. It was who got to the finish line first. And that was a lesson I learned. Thank you very much.